Let me open my notes here. And what I'm going to do is just read a quick, brief bio on all these gentlemen, simply because if I let them tell you how wonderful they are, we, the panel will be over. So, <laughs> actually, I tell you what, why don't you introduce yourself with that? You first. Hold on. Let me say, Garth, go ahead. My name is Garth. Hi. <laughs> and I'm happy to be here. Come on. Come on. Peer pressure. I'm Brian, <laughs> and I'm thrilled to be on this panel with my good friends. I guess this is how we do it in Canada. I'm Brad, nice to meet you. I feel like I belong here. It's a warm and lovely room. There's a lot of love here. Thank you very much. My name's Warren, and I don't feel like I belong here either. If my kids were here. Hello, I'm Justin. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. There is a reason for this, Ralph. Is I mean, we didn't, we didn't, yeah, this is not just blindsiding you, but the point that we're oh. all trying to make here, right. it's a really important point, which is that as I was walking, as I was walking up here today, I was thinking, you know, we're doing this, is that kind of silly? And then I went, wait a minute. Every moment we ever spent in the studio making really good stuff, we laughed. I thought you were going to say hi. Yeah. And we were high. <laughs> yes. We laughed and we were high. It's fun doing what we do, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. Definitely. The best. Yes. It certainly is. So shoot first, away. Well, first of go all, ahead, we're, well. we're in the entertainment business. For God's sake, be entertaining. Exactly. Come on. Exactly. And, you know, too, Bob? Okay. You know what? This is hard to have to follow you. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Hold on a sec. Let me just tell, tell them all about you and how wonderful you all are, okay? Because they need to know this. Uh, Garth Richardson uh, started his career at age 15, working at Nimbus 9 in his father's uh, Yorkville studio. Uh, second engineer in Bob Seger's legendary night move. Richardson moves to, moved to Los Angeles at the insistence of a renowned producer, Michael Wagner. Uh, Worked to phase one, worked include, <laughs> mentored by some musical greats, including Bob Ezrin, Brian Christian, Jack Richardson, his legendary father, who of course was responsible for the Guess Who. Uh, Jack Richardson, producer of the Year Award category, uh, was nominated in that, third uh, Juno nomina nomination. Uh, he's, his work with the uh, pop rockers Headley, won previously for Melvin's and Jesus Livered, Lizard Livers. I like that, yes. He produced Rage Against the Machine's self-titled epic album, uh, debut album, earning him a Grammy yeah. nomination and securing his place in the Pantheon. <laughs> Actually, Rage Against the Machine's Killing in the Name of earned number one spot for the UK's Christmas single. Uh, he's now working... <laughs> My favorite Christmas song ever. I know, it's I know. Our favorite Fuck you, Christmas I will do song. you tell me. Actually, <laughs> it's a big he's, hit. He's working... Actually, he's found teaching and doing demonstrations at Nimbus. Um, Nimbus offers a program in advanced music production, beats urban music, music business program. Programs start in January, April, July, and October. Find out more by going to <laughs> nimbusrecording.com. Can I dance too? Brian. Brian Mar Moncars, 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 my God. I'm, I'm Based out of Rattlebox Studios, North, uh, North Toronto. Uh, he does a lot of rock bands, of course, Circus Survive Atlantic, which landed a Billboard Modern Pop Alternative number one hit. Uh, has done The Junction, Universal, Jimmy Bowskill Band, and is, and is through his association with Bob Ezrin and Grammy-winning producer David Bottrell, though years of working side by side with masters of their craft. Anyway, moving right along. Welcome, Brian. Thank you. Yeah. Woo! Actually, it probably would have been faster having them do it, you know, just picking out the highlights. Do you want, actually, we can do that yeah. ourselves. Go ahead, Bradley. We can do it. Take, Take it over. over. Uh, my name is Brad Conn. I'm a <laughs> producer, songwriter. Um, and you're buff. And he's buff. 
uh, and apparently I'm pretty buff. Um, yes, yeah, started as a songwriter, was an inspiring songwriter, got into recording, always wanted to make my recording sound better and better, developed a studio called Home Farm Studios, which is on the outskirts of London, and um, Where is it? Where is it? in Radlett. Oh, yeah. Do you know that? You know that spot? So, um, yeah, so it's a studio in the middle of a field, and uh, there's a nice vibe. We do a lot of writing with people, a lot of artist development. I had a couple of hits with um, some electronic dance music crossover people, uh, Pendulum, Chase and Status, uh, Drum Sound, Bassline Smith, a few other guys. Um, but I really like working with rock bands, singer-songwriters. I'm really keen to meet great uh, Canadian artists who are looking for a producer. And uh, if there's any of you out there, please feel free to come and speak to me later. Um, and I started a company a couple of years ago, Creative Industries, which allows me to operate kind of broad, more broadly in uh, the creative space. I've got into producing some quite cool live events. We did a charity concert uh, in Central Park last year uh, where we had the Foo Fighters, the Black Keys, and Neil Young come and play 60,000 people, all free ticket, uh, free event, um, raising money and awareness for charity. And, well, free, uh, free is good. It was I like free. free. It was free, yeah. Cheap so, is okay, but free is great. Yeah, you had to download the app and donate a bit of time to the cause, and then that, that um, earned you a couple of tickets. Okay. So um, that, that's a little bit about Okay. Me. Thanks. Bob Ezrin? I've, I've said enough. I, I, I was just up well, there actually, for an uh, hour. Uh, yeah. Does anyone not know who Bob Ezrin is? Do, hold up a hand, actually. No. They may have come that's, from that's another kind. planet. Thank you. But oh. most of you were here before, right? So you don't need to hear it. Perfect. Thank you okay. Much. Warren? Hi. Yeah, my name's Warren Livesey. I'm originally from the UK. Moved to Vancouver about 11 years ago. And um, my history is I, a lot of UK bands, obviously, from the, the to... Deacon Blue, Paul Young, Jesus Jones. Um, since I've been in... in One of the great... Th that Jesus... Did you do right here, right now? No, I didn't. Oh, never mind. No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But thank you, for, thank you for drawing attention to that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I also... Uh, I've also <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I did the one I didn't sell as well. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, so, uh, where was I? Oh, yes. Um, I did a lot of work in Australia, primarily with a band called Midnight Oil, uh, four records with them. And um, since I've been in Vancouver, um, I've mainly been working with... Matthew Good. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Yeah. Justin? Uh, I'm Justin Gray, one-fifth of the worst boy band ever. <clears throat> Whoa. Well, wait a but a handsome boy no, I, we make, Listen, we make great records. I'm just saying, we, we don't look great. Well, Brad looks great, but that's why he's the front man. So, uh, <laughs> I'll keep it... Uh, Ooh, kick, 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 kick. Oh, they do interventions about this, I think. Uh, <clears throat> currently, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't end. It just keeps going. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Uh, currently, uh, I have a record out with uh, Mariah Carey, uh, her single, which is part of a movie called Oz the Great and Powerful. I'm in the studio right now with, well, not right now, but currently with uh, John Legend, uh, Enrique Iglesias. Uh, I have worked in the past with um, Amy Winehouse, a couple of the Spice Girls, and uh, I've been very fortunate to make a lot of great records in Canada with artists like, but not limited to, uh, Wide Mouth Mason, Econoline Crush, um, uh, the list goes on. I don't know, I'm a terrible self-promoter. But anyway, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having us, and um, well, I can't believe people want to hear about what we do. So thank you so much for coming and showing interest. We live behind the, you know, we live behind the console, behind the glass so much that for us to sometimes get to share our experiences is actually really, really rewarding. In many ways, it makes it worth it. So thank you for having us. Hey, you're more than welcome. This is going to be fun. This panel. Now, what I did as, as a preparation for this, I went out and asked a lot of you what you actually wanted to ask. And, I, and, and it's, th these questions basically are coming from you. So I just made a whole list of them. And the, my first session was in 1959 in Windsor, Ontario. I might as well say 1859 because people don't even remember who the hell the Beatles are, for Christ's sake. So, but I went to, and it was direct to disc. And we leaned in and leaned out, and we left with two refs and a, and a mother. And we went direct to the thing. And then I went through two, the three, the four, the eight, 
the 24, and then the, the, the sky is the limit. Now, there was a definition of the producer uh, back when I was working a lot as a producer, and that was basically meant being a politician, a song doctor, an entrepreneur, a psychologist, have a knowledge of recording equipment, and have a real understanding of music, pitch, tuning, performance, etc. Now, the laptop and the internet seem to be king. Has that role really changed? And we'll start, Garth? No. Because you know, what has to happen is, it's still about a song. You could do a song with this and have this out as it. If it's a really shitty song, it's still gonna sound shit. If you do it on gold, actually plated, plated mics, if it's a bad song, it's still a bad song. It doesn't matter who we do, you know, you know, you know, we actually have to have it on anything. We just need to learn how to, to write great songs. And that is still the same from back in 1812, I think you were born? Uh, yeah. Till, yeah. Till, yeah. till now, you know. Excellent. Any thoughts on that? Anyone else? Uh, I, I totally agree. I mean, I, I think maybe what we do is provide uh, artists and bands with the opportunity to feel comfortable enough to share, you know, a great song with us in the studio, you know? So I think your psychology reference is huge because that's a big part about what we do. You know, being a friendly personality, being a hard ass when you have to, really pushing bands to do their best, bring the best songs out of them. Yeah, it's a very complex role, Bradley. Yeah, I totally agree. A lot of the things you mentioned, I found myself nodding my head. Um, to all those attributes, and I think that just because the technology is available uh, for people to record music doesn't mean that their understanding of music is any greater. Right. Um, and I think that as a producer, it's very important to make the artist feel comfortable, even down to things like headphone mixes. I mean, it's so important that they can hear themselves properly and they feel comfortable. And you know, when it's time to for them to do what they do, they feel there's a support system around them. And I think you know, psychologists and just being friend and understanding music. You know, is, is a big part of that, and, and I also just want to echo what these guys have said that it's, it starts and ends with the song, for me at least. I, Bob, I think any, any further comments on that? Or? Um, yeah, well, of course. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Sorry, I lost my first head. First of all, I, I think it has changed, and so I'll start there. It, it's changed and yet remain the same. It has changed in one way, which is that uh, in the old days when you didn't have. Uh, the technology at your fingertips, the producer was really reliant upon other people to do the performing. And today, there's a lot of people who are producers who are actually performing virtually everything that's going on on the records that you hear, with the exception of the you know, lead vocals. And even in, sometimes in those cases, they, they do that too. There's the Dr. Luke, who is everything, um, including the writer and then has, uh, you know, collaborates with a performer and puts them forward for their performance. So I think there, is, there have been some changes, and it does allow the producer um, in this business to specialize a little more than we were able to before. Right. Uh, when I found out that in 2011 there were only two number one records of the 12 number ones that year that had real drums on them, I was astounded. Yeah. I was well, astounded. Well, and, and that's, you know, that, that sort of speaks to what I'm talking about, but then doesn't. You know, the fact is, an instrument's an instrument. If you hit it with a stick or you touch a button, it's an instrument. If it makes music, it makes music, and we're fine with that. The, the, I think the, the, the other thing, when you're working with an artist, the, the producer's primary role is to, uh, is to make them feel safe. And, and you do that by gaining confidence, gaining their personal confidence and their artistic confidence. The best thing in the world is when an artist turns to you and says, how was that? You say it, it was good enough and they go, okay. And, um, and you have to get, that's a really tough place to get to, isn't it? Right. I mean, you really now, have to work together. Because I'm, I'm just gonna move on. How would you gain their confidence with a new artist? Do you actually have break bread with them? Do you talk to them? Do you commute with, commune with them? I, th I think you um, you don't do it you don't do it mechanically like you've got a system. I think you develop good people skills or maybe this job just actually um, so automatically selects people with good people skills. Um, I think I, I'm just interested in what they do and I work with artists that I really passionately love the music of so you've got that common ground from that point of view. Um, so 
that's, that's really where I start, is really the connection is their music and your passion for their music. And from that, then other music that you all share. Um, and then, and from that, life interests that you share. So I really just connect with people and with them right. as a person. Now, like, Justin, do you feel that the whole personality that you have to, it's almost like dating? Is that part of the equation or is it just purely a business? Uh, <clears throat> for me, I would say 95% of what eventually become records that I produce start with songwriting, start with co-writing sessions that I'll have with, with a writer, which I don't... In, Echoing Garth. You know, you know, and so the, it's almost always the first thing that I say to somebody the first time I write with them is, this is like, almost like a blind date and you come out with a baby. You know, that's what the song is to me. And so, yeah, I know. What, what if it's an ugly baby? Trust me, you didn't want to be on some of those dates I went oh. on. <laughs> my, my, my Maury Povich episode is like in three weeks. So... <clears throat> <laughs> um, I watch too much daytime TV. You know, the, I think a lot of the times when I'm working with artists, they'll come, they'll come to me. Uh, I, I don't so much co-write with bands on that level like some of these guys do. I come more from, you know, a, a, a record label. Not even a record label. That really sounded obnoxious. Like, uh, or, you know, an artist that I meet um, will sometimes come to me because of a record that I've maybe worked on or that I've maybe done. And one of the things that I've always tried to do as a producer, when I look at people that I really respected, people like Hugh Padgham, Bob, you know, you know, all of these people, they always had respect for what the artist did first. And it was never about, you know, and I love Luke, I know Luke, and, uh, you know, and he has Luke sound. That's the Luke sound, and people go to Luke for that. I've always been a bigger fan of people that have gone to... Uh, you know, record producers that were able to sort of cross over and, and pull from, you know, various different uh, influences and, and, and loves and, and make what that artist does better for them, as opposed to trying to come into the room and go, okay, well, this is the Justin Gray sound, and, and that's why you're here. You know, I, I think that's really, and, and I think there's like three producers that can do that. You know, Luke can do that, and, you know, and, and even before that, there were people ah, like but the Wasn't Neptune. the comment earlier on that, that <clears throat> Dr. Luke has a sound, you know yes. a Dr. Luke record? Correct. Yeah, and I'm saying, and, and people want that. But I also find that now, for, I mean, at least on the side that I'm at, I feel like there's a changing trend now coming from artists, from management, from labels, from indie labels, from whoever, where they're, you know, Luke, I mean, Luke is a monster. I mean, that guy, I mean, he's amazing. The people that work with him are incredible. But I feel like there's a little, a little bit of a shift in terms of the tone of what is trying, you know, what people are trying, the records people are trying to make right now. And by the way, y y you don't need to come out with a $2 million uh, you know, marketing budget anymore. I, I mean, if you're willing to work your ass off, even at that level, I mean, the internet has leveled the playing field a lot for people if they're willing to put in the work. You know? But that, that work is enormous. A friend yeah. of mine, Jay Frank, wrote a book, Hack Your Hit. If you've read that, I, I finished that book, and I'm doing a, a seminar with him later on today, and it's, I was exhausted. I was just, like, wrung out. I mean, I, I, I analyzed them on a different, different thing. Now, uh, several of you are involved in education, okay? Now, back in the day, we all apprenticed to people. We all learned sort of through osmosis. Why the education now? What, what is, because there are so many things, there's Fanshawe College, which uh, I used to work, do guests with Jack at, and there are so many, your, your own Nimbus productions and stuff. Why the focus on education as opposed to having them apprentice? Garth, you want to start with that? Okay, I have to say that I, um, you know, somebody sends me their uh, basic file, and I get audio one, audio two, audio three, audio four, audio five, audio six, and the thing that my dad did did to Bob was m my dad completely, basically beat him up, but then the really shitty thing was Bob got me back because then Bob beat the living crap out of me. And, and, and th you know what, there's this whole thing of where, where, where we have, everybody in this room probably has a laptop, probably is at home, and, and you're all doing your own songs, but you, you, you have to know how to, to do it right. And I have seen more shitty you know, songs, you know, things come to me, but it's also knowing how to be absolutely great. And you have to learn the skills, and the skills that I got taught from Bob and and from you know my dad, you know it it still has to happen now, and I'm seeing it not. 
There, the, uh, yeah, let, let me let me just comment on that. There's obviously a, there's an economic sea change. There has been in everything in our lives. Everything. It's not just the music industry, but there are fewer studios now, and those studios that do exist, they have people in there that are in their 30s, 40s, and 50s who are fighting to hang on to their jobs for a very good reason because there ain't much else to do, right? And um, so the succession. The first of all the uh, the availability of these places to go and work and try to learn um, has has shrunk, and the the whole process of succession has has stopped now. People, it's kind of frozen in time. So there's very few places places where people learn. So na now people are forced to go and seek it out at schools where they hope they're going to get a great education. And the problem with the school environment is that sitting in a room like this with me giving you notes about stuff, it's all great and it engages you on a certain intellectual level and maybe you'll go home and think about it and maybe you'll get it right. But where you really learn is when you're in a studio with me and you have a responsibility to do something that I taught you about an hour before the session start and you, you get it right or you get, you get a boot up your ass, that's how you learn. You learn because you're scared to make a mistake. Right, now of all of and, you, was it through osmosis or did you actually physically go into a school and learn about the board and whatever, Brian? I, uh, I was on the receiving end of that boot <laughs> a number oh, of times boot with is Bob. That? Yeah. But, you know, I mean, I, maybe I worry a little bit. I am a little bit on the education side. I, I, I teach every once in a while at Ryerson University here in Toronto. Um, and, you know, you see kids that are coming up that maybe don't have the benefit of working with someone like Bob, like I did. And I'm very, you know, I'm very fortunate for those experiences. Um, but I think, you know, the, what Bob taught me, what David Bottrell taught me, those are, you know, gifts that really hard to come by. So I think the education thing, if used in the right way, can, can be great because, you know, a lot of up and coming engineers and producers aren't gonna have those opportunities. You know, I think the old way of production, I shouldn't say old way of production, but the way of production, especially rock bands, you know, having a band in the studio, like that, that's becoming a dying art, you know, and, and it, it, it's, it's sort of sad. And I feel fortunate that I've had people impart the knowledge on to me, you know, how to deal with certain situations in the studio that you're not gonna get, you know, every day in school. Right. Yeah. Bradley, how did you acquire I feel the same story? way. Um, I also learned by osmosis. I was um, an apprentice to a producer, songwriter. Um, we would work largely at my own facility, so there was a certain amount of trial and error there where I could, you know, fiddle with things after the session was finished and kind of work out how to do it. But essentially... Um, no, it was uh, Joel Bogan, his name was. Yeah. Um, yeah, so essentially, again, I, I had that going on, and... Um, he was he was tough with me, you know. I'm sure everyone here, their mentors uh, have been tough, cru you know. Cruel but fair. Yeah, I mean, I remember I like a real that. defining moment. Never where fair. I had a uh, session at Abbey Road, and um, I remember the engineer there kind of doing things that I just thought were, f were were fundamental that should have been handled a certain way. That he kind of would, you know, just labeling and things like that. And I it was at that moment that I thought, wow, this has all been really worth it, you know, because you kind of think, oh, you're going to this legendary place, and. Right. You know, but it was really nice to see that that, that, that teaching and that wisdom had, had set me to a certain it, level. It had an impact. Warren? Yeah, yeah I didn't have a formal um, training in, in okay. studios. Um, I, I did uh, some formal work musically um, when I was growing up and um, uh, studied music from that aspect. Um, I learned by doing a lot. I started really with a lot of like the independent scene that was happening in the UK around the late 70s, early 80s. There was a lot of big explosion of independent labels at that point with very low budget you know, work the, where they were looking for more up and coming engineers and producers. And then later on I got to work with, with bigger producers and I learned a lot from them. So, so by it os was osmosis. Again, through, through osmosis? Yes. Uh, yes. Justin? Uh, I've actually never had the benefit of, of being able to sort of sit and be a fly on the wall, so to speak. Um, I wish I had, because I felt like uh, I maybe made mistakes along the way. And, and not just musically, actually, professionally, you know, getting into shitty contracts because I was maybe a little bit more desperate to do the work than maybe I should have been. Um, and uh, there's nothing worse than trying to deal with having a bad contract. Um, and especially sometimes when there's a huge amount of success on a song, 
because then all of a sudden, you know, there's a lot more to discuss uh, when you're dealing with, uh, you know, having a, a number one record or, rent, you know, especially if it's an indie artist and now you have the argument of, well, who really owns this master, you know, and you start to get in, and that's maybe a little bit more technical, but, but that is actually a bit of the really crappy side of being a producer um, is having to contend with that. But uh, ultimately, in the end of the day, I think, you know, just circling back around to the first thing that Gar said, the, the, the best way to succeed in this business is to either write great songs, produce great songs, be involved with great songs, because what happens is that essentially, you know, people talk about that. They go, oh yeah, you know that song that so-and-so did? Oh yeah, it, you start to get caught up in the wake and in the success of these records. And I, I think that if we all look back at our careers at some point, there was that, you know, that ground zero moment where you did that one record that sort of you got to get pulled with in, in, in the wake of its oh, yeah. success. Yep. Right, and then, and then at that point, either you sink or you swim in many ways. It's like, okay, well then now, what's the next record? You know, for me, in Canada, uh, <clears throat> the first record that I did was a record called Absolute by a band called Jack Soul. And, th and at that time, they were, you know, they were incredibly successful on Queen Street. And for me, it was like, we made it, because that was the first band that got a record deal from a record that we had produced. And then at that point, it was either we were gonna, you know, I, w I was gonna get caught up in the success or, or, or not be able to handle it, unfortunately. That's the best thing that you could do is good, do work and then continue to do good work. And especially as a producer, not to go on, but I think our biggest job is when people entrust us with the records that they make, they go, okay, well, what do I need to sound like in a year from now when a record comes out? How, you know, how, do, we, how do we get ahead of the curve of who those people are that we're essentially competing with, right? And, and that, is, that is, to me, in my opinion, that doesn't matter if you're dealing with an independent artist or if you're dealing with uh, you know, a, a massive signed artist. You know, you, you know, the part of our job is to anticipate the trend and ha hopefully they can come, you know, it, it, they can, they can, that and, record comes and out. And complement it, And complement it, yeah, exactly. Okay, now you all have, have well, actually, I was just okay. gonna go to the next question. Um, basically, you all have the internet at your fingertips. Now, you're, we're talking about building relationships. And I, 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 in my life, I am the sum of the people I know well. If I can't pick up a phone to someone and they know me and I can't get any juice out of them, then my, my life, might as well, I might as well cease to exist. What I've, I've seen is the internet can, uh, like artists, uh, players, mixers, studios, all, these, all this is on the internet. How much of that is referrals by your peer group, by people you trust, or how much is experimentation where you kind of going on and surfing and looking for new talent? How much, what was it like 80, 20, 50, 50? Exactly what, how open are you to just going out there by yourself? Or do you look for referrals from your peer group? Go ahead. Are we going in order? <laughs> no, we, we don't go care, in order. actually. I'll, you know, yeah. I'll go first. I have a daughter. You yeah. have a daughter that's actually 18 years old, and she <laughs> finds every new band, and she goes, Dad, this is really cool. And, and, and I also go online, and I go on to YouTube, and, and you know what? You just, have to, you just have to read magazine, rock magazines. You, you know, it's just every day. You have to look and find and surf for it. So, Brian? Um, yeah, I mean, I do definitely go online and listen to stuff, but I find... I mean, especially in, in, in my area of work, which is definitely working with great live rock bands, I find there's a, a lot of discrepancy between what I hear online and when I go out to see a show. You know, and then the band maybe is a little mediocre. And it's just because of technology. You know, we're able to be detective everything and auto-tune everything. But I look for great rock bands that can play and that can carry themselves on stage because they'll bring it to the studio. So it's hard sometimes to look on the internet because... You know, it's almost like a lie. <laughs> Bradley? Um, I do a lot of development, so often I go in there and I see something that I like and then help build it to that place. Um, a lot of my work comes from referral, actually, and word of mouth, and I'm happy to go out there on my own. I mean, I'm here, this is my first time in Canada, you know, I've never been to Canadian Music Week. I'm here looking for things, you know, really enjoying the panels. But um, I'm, I'm happy to go out there and, 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 and find bands. And One of my no first releases uh, was, okay. was in Australia. It was exactly that. I saw a girl in a club. Went after her afterwards. I said, listen, are you looking for somebody to record you? You know, I really like it. I ended up um, doing some of the production and playing keyboards on, on the album. Sweet. Bob? I'm pretty well all referral. I mean, it's okay. not to say that I don't go out and look. I do. And I, just, right. I stumble across all sorts of things that I love, which I tend to send on to other people. Mm -hmm. um, but 
mostly it's somebody calls me and I get really busy and then I'm really busy until somebody calls me again and then I get really busy and that's kind of been the way it is, you know. Um, uh, and, I, you know, uh, Brian is right that there's, there are... The good news is that anyone can put something out there and the bad news is that anyone can put something out there. So you can yeah. spend a lot of time wading through, through crap and as you say, you know, you, there are people who, you, who trust you when you mm -hmm. pick up a phone. I have a little group of people that I trust very much. And I'll give you a good example. There's somebody that everyone in this room should know um, from here. Her name is Ariana Gillis. Mm -hmm. And a guy named Rick, uh, Rick O'Berry. Did you guys, did, uh, did you ever see that uh, dolphin rescue film called The Cove? It won a, an Academy Award. So that's the guy, Rick, Rick O'Berry, who goes into these places and risks his life to save dolphins. I got an email from Rick O'Berry, of all people, saying, you have to hear this girl. Reminds me of Joni Mitchell when she was 19. So, okay, you know, and the, the dolphin guy says, listen, and I put on this track, it's called, it's called John and the Monster. Trust me, go online, listen to this girl, check out this track, She's astoundingly good. And so that's, that sort of thing does happen to me a lot, like strange people turning me on to stuff. Okay. Yeah, I think it's mostly referral. And, um, and if I do try and, uh, you know, like going out to CMW showcases, you might find things. I saw a great band last night um, that actually my, my son was doing live sound for. Um, so you find things like that, but it's all still really through people that you know. Um, what I, uh, they are the, the Walkervilles, playing again tonight at uh, the Horseshoe at 8:30. Let's promote them all. That's anything that we know. Yeah. We should, yeah. Let's promote. Um, I, mean, I don't have Ariana Gillis right. signed, but I want you guys just. Uh, everybody should just know this is a talented young person from Toronto that you should be aware of. Sweet. What I have found, though, is that very occasionally, it's probably not more than 5%, I will get somebody contacting me. And then it's like, I'm up for hearing anything if somebody finds me on, my, you know, on the internet, through my webpage or whatever. Right. And I just did a project, did some mixing for somebody in Germany because they, they contacted me and sent me their stuff, and I liked it. So, Sweet. Justin? I think the bottom line is um, you develop relationships and you foster those relationships, and in the same way that people turn you on to projects, you can turn them on to projects. You know, I mean, sometimes people don't, you know, my skill set as a producer and as a songwriter might not be perfect for that person who may really want to work with me, but I'm like, you know what? Really, the person you should be working with is Garth. You know, and so I'd have no problem. You know, I mean, it, 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 but the point is, you, you start relationships, you sort of grow with people, you succeed as they succeed, and, you know, it, it becomes this, you know, I hate this word, but it's a very synergistic relationship where everybody kind of grows and succeeds together, and some people kind of don't keep making the cut with and you. And, <laughs> and some fall by the wayside. Okay, a quick question. That, this was a common theme for most of these people. Most of you have managers, is that correct? Yes. Yes. You, you, you don't? No. No. I'm, un I'm unmanageable. Oh, no. <laughs> I am. I'm sorry. Who knew? I've tried. I have tried. Who knew? <laughs> but, if you had a manager, you might have a shot to really make it in this business. I just um. Well, if, if a, hot, a hot artist, male, female, band, whatever, wanted to attract your but, attention... But there, that... there, is, there is something to be said for it, though. I do want to say, like, uh, in a way, I regret that I don't because uh, these guys, they have managers who are in the A&R uh, offices day in, day out, they know every project, when it's coming up, who's doing it, who's not doing it, and they're there to remind the NR people to think about their clients, which is... But if I could jump in, managers are not a... Uh, that, that's not like the magic that happens in your career, do you know what I mean? Like, managers can only enhance the effort that you're willing to put in for yourself, do you know? Like, then I don't think they're gonna jump in and go, you know, you go, oh, I got a manager, and it's it, I'm gonna make it now. You know, I, I think managers are only as good as you enable them to be. If you do shitty work, you're not gonna get oh, work. Oh, of course. It doesn't matter who manages you. Of course, you, but, you know? but totally. the, one of the things that, one of the good things about having a manager is being in front of people's, you know, being in the mindset of the people who will hire you for a living. There are other ways to do it, uh, but they're tough. They're tough, they're, they're time consuming, somewhat expensive. Um, my thing about management was just, I ended up getting, you know, people just call me. You know, they, they would bypass my manager, just call me, and then I'd get the work, and then 
the manager would say, well, okay, so what deal do you want to cut? So I would say, well, you know, the deal is in this format. And by the time it was over, like, I was giving 15% to somebody to ask me questions. And I was like, nah, I don't think so. I do, I, I do have to say, me? my manager is sitting over there, Jody Ambrosio. <laughs> Great guy. I love him. He opens tons of doors for me. I mean, doors that I wouldn't, you know, being here in Canada, doors that I wouldn't really be able to open on my own. And, you know, he provides me with opportunities to get jobs. You know, he doesn't get me the jobs, but he puts me in front of people, you know, hopefully they find me likable, and then I, and then I nail the jobs. That's what right. he does, and it's great. Well, I've, I've found the same thing with successful writers now. They have managers. Uh, Mike Dixon, who may or may not be in the room, I see him in Ireland. I see him in L.A. I see him in just the weirdest place. I'll turn around, and he's standing there watching an act and watching for songwriters. He's got people from Australia. He puts with people from Nashville, but for whatever. So um, it's, it's really, really, uh, I think being, having people to speak on your behalf that know your taste and can, can execute that are very, very important. Um, can I just add to that? Um, yeah, I wanted sure. to say this before as well, that um, starting out, it can be really hard. I've, I've been on the receiving end of a load of shitty contracts, and um, I, I got myself a lawyer, really good lawyer in London, um, whatever, towards the end of last year, and he just started saying, you know, you should structure things like this, and suddenly I was finding there was a whole area that I could make money from that I wasn't aware of before. So just, you know, you don't want to scare people going in there with a contract, but you do want to represent your rights, both as a songwriter and, and as a producer. So I do think it's important to at least know what deals are being done. And um, even if you don't find yourself in that position straight away, once you do have the trust of an artist and you are able to kind of have that conversation, I think it's really important to know what your options right. are. There's an old expression, actually, I heard it when I moved to Nashville. It's not the money, it's the money. So there you go. Anyway, hold on here. Blah, blah. Oh, actually, back in the day, and this was a question from me, because um, George Martin's an old pal and your, your dad was an old pal. Back in the day, there seemed to be a producer on every pro project. Now you look at two and sometimes three producers on a, on a, on a big hit project. Or ten. Or ten, literally. Why would that be? You want to I think, isn't that more to do with, it's more to do with uh, pop albums, isn't it, yeah, when you've got, pop. I still think, you know, with a rock band, it's unlikely that you're going to have five or six producers on the album, and, and if you take Adele as a reference, which I think is really interesting, yes, she had a number of different producers on that album, yes. but it was really masterminded by Rick Rubin, um, who, you know, needs no introduction, so I think it depends what area of music you're coming from, I think in the pop context, which I don't do that much of, um, often it's people who have, like Bob said before, written, produced, arranged the tracks themselves, those tracks get submitted and that's pretty much the end product. You know, there might be external mixing and mastering that goes on in it. Whereas for a rock band like what you do, it, it wouldn't make sense to have eight different producers come into the studio, right? It's true. I mean, I think, you know, there's, because of iTunes and MP3s and downloads and all that fun stuff, um, maybe the album is kind of disappearing a little bit and people are really focusing on singles. And not that that's a bad thing. I mean, when you look... 900,000 Justin Timberlake what, records this week. When you look at, like, historically, um, you know, in the past, it was a singles-driven market. You know, the Beatles had a number of singles before they ever recorded an album. So I'm not saying that it's a bad thing. In rock music, yeah, we usually just have one producer and uh, we see the project through. They, that's a, you, you raise an interesting point. There is no more visible human being in the entire universe than Justin Timberlake. He's been everywhere. He's doing movies. He's, you know, he's modeling underwear. He's got Saturday Night Live. He's on The View. He's on every chat show in history. He, they have spent millions and millions of dollars setting up the moment that he was releasing this long-awaited album. And the whole industry is going nuts because he sold 900,000 units. And to me, that's pathetic. That is pathetic. That is pathetic. After all that work, for a guy that's that big of a star, what's wrong? That's not much more than Mumford & Sons spent in, or sold in their first week. And they had... They had the, but you, know, you attribute to, that to the quality of the song? The, the songs he's recording, perhaps? I don't know. And I don't, I'm, I'm not pretending to be, you know, like I don't have the solution for this kind of stuff. But I do have to say that there's lessons to be learned here. And, and for me... 
uh, the Adele record, the Mumford & Sons record, a lot of this new folk stuff that's coming up and selling beyond what anybody ever expected it to sell. And, 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 and still, some of the urban stuff that's really honest and real. And, and that, it just shows that there's a connection that, that we strike with people when we make real, when we make real music. When we are being honest and the music is touching and, we're, and they believe us and they don't think it's artifice and they don't think it's a Dr. Luke record with me singing. I'm with you. I'm a, like, I'm in awe of Dr. Luke. I think the guy is unbelievable. But it's his record, you know. So like if you're putting somebody else in front of it, as an audience, I'm not connecting as much with that person as I would have if it was their construct. So I just feel like, I feel like there's a... There, that there's this thing of artifice. We have been chasing each other up the charts. We have been chasing a sound, a style, a fashion. We've been trying to figure out what we ought to be. We've been trying to do what we did that it worked last week, so let's do it again this week. Instead of concentrating on having a burning vision, a need to make a statement, something that we write that's just fucking great. And we write it because it's fucking great. Not because it sounds like it's going to be a number one record, but because it's the best fucking thing we can do at that particular moment. And when we do that, I think then we have a chance at really connecting with an audience and forming a lasting relationship. Good, because that leads me to... That's good. That was one of us right. fuck yes. <laughs> Actually, that leads me to the next question, which... Do hits start with the quote-unquote voice of the artist and their journey, or the needs of radio, or the quality of the video, or the marketing, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, etc., the production of the record? What are the most important parts of that? Uh, I've got to say song. I really think it starts and ends with a song. I, the I know song. you didn't have that in your list, but that's... No, but it is because you're saying what's the evolution of a hit? A hit. Yes. A hit. My dad a song told me this. that people buy a lot of, right? That's a hit. That's a hit. That's how we define it. God so bless it, yes. Bob, Bob? He wins. Bob, my, my dad, Jack, <laughs> Jack told me years ago, and, and I said, you know, Dad, I really just want to do this. He said, okay, we have to have a talk. And I am actually waiting, you know, this three-hour actual talk, and he comes in and he goes, okay, ready? I go, yeah. He goes, good songs sell, bad songs don't. Gets up and leaves. <laughs> and I'm like, like that's it. He goes, that's it. I think, I think too, I think too that um, the the concept of of a hit song. You know, like I love I love following fellow songwriters on Twitter or producers, and they're like, wrote a smash today. I'm like, really? Yeah. It hasn't come out yet. Yeah. I don't see the credits in, in allmusic.com. You know, what exactly is, defines the word smash for you? you know? and I always found that funny. And to me, I think the concept of having a hit song is almost like trying to, to, to win a lottery by choosing you know, nine numbers consecutively correct out of a hundred. You know, I, mean, I, I, I just think the concept of a hit is, is, is almost an anomaly in many ways because... There's records that come out and they're hits, and you think, "Well, this is strange. Nobody in the world seems to be asking for it. Adele." There's a great example. I mean, we keep circling back to her, but it's just like, it's like, okay, here comes a girl that's. I mean, "Chasing Pavements" I thought was exceptionally good, but then someone like you comes out. It's a piano vocal song that comes out at the radio and gets played everywhere in the world all the time. It's like, did someone think that was going to be a hit? I mean, eventually it came out and it did become a hit because it was so honest. And I'm with you in terms of the sense of honesty, but there's also art in what Dr. Luke does for sure. But, in my opinion, <clears throat> but the concept of a hit is all-encompassing. It's, is, is, is your, is, first of all, is the song amazing, A. You know, is the production right? Is the artist selling it? Is there, unfortunately, is there web presence? Are they great live? Does the label believe in it? Are they a priority? Do the people in the radio department believe in it? Are the marketing people on board? Then you haven't even shipped it out to radio yet. <laughs> you know, and then do the... Justin Timberlake syndrome. There you go. It's a, heck, it's a good record, in my opinion. You know, but, you know, and, and, then, and then does radio like it? And then if radio likes it, then they feature it. And then do the people that listen to the radio station, do they go online because they vote for it because they like it on, you know, kick it or, or pick it? You know, it's just like the, the process. I mean, Beyonce has had a couple of records where she's not had smash records. So I don't think there's, there's, a, I don't think there's a guarantee that who you are gets a song to become a hit no. or not. As a writer, and I had my first number one when I was 22, 
and I'm 117 Bragger. now. <laughs> no, I'm 117 now, but I, I, I turn out probably two songs a week. I demo 40 songs a year, average maybe five or six records, get a hit every third year. I'm actually working on a one in 300 margin. That's good. And, and yo, I know, I, I've, I've been doing that for 100 years. Uh, but people, people I, I hear, oh, it's a smash, I just wrote it. Exactly what you say. If any, another person comes up to you, it's, oh, it's a smash. They go, oh, please. That's the kiss of death. Literally, if you go up to someone and say, oh, it's a smash. And the, the other thing which I, I find, because uh, what invites you into a song is melody, what keeps you there is lyric. When I go see bands, I just came from South by Southwest, I was at BLAM, BLARM conference in, in Oslo. When I go see a band, what I see that night is I don't, I actually see music. I don't hear it. I then, if I really like them, there's something really cool about them, I then have to go online and look them up and then hear the songs because that really is the underpinning. Everything is great on stage. They're looking great, they're moving wonderfully, their instruments are great, but it's really, it, it really does come back to the song, and I'm really pleased that you're amp reinforcing that all the way through, it's really important. Uh, could, could I add to that as well, just that sure. if you're not a songwriter, it still pays to, n to know songs, to be able to spot a good song and, and to really know music. Um, and it's a lesson that has come to me time and time again, and you know, I just think it's really important. I also, yeah. um, I mean, I agree with everyone's songs, very you know, instrumental in making a career, but I think something that's lacking in, you know, in today's music industry is d artist development. You know, if you, take a, if you take an act like Bruce Springsteen, for instance, he really didn't have a hit until a few albums in with Born to Run, and today, I think if Springsteen was signed and he didn't sell a lot of you know, records on, on his first try, he'd be dropped. And I think there's a lot of great artists out there that aren't having their potential realized because they're not selling right away. Because the world has changed. With all due you're 100% right. No, no, totally. But the world has changed, right? So back then, you, you wanted to, the concept of development was you go on the road, you play 150 shows a year, 200 shows. Springsteen got to make three records. And it was on that record where it was like, this is do or die. Oh, I totally okay? agree. And now, and now the problem is, it's like, the, the sad part is, and it, actually I find it changing from my end, I find labels are actually signing artists that don't have presence, that don't have that web presence, yeah. which, which, which they can fail just as fast. But now it's, I think there's too many labels that are trying to find the momentum, but the onus then comes back on the artists. They have to work, I mean, I keep saying, they have to work hard. If you can't want it more than they do. Right. Well, I mean, as you know, as consumers in general, it's very immediate. We want everything right away these days. We don't, you know, we don't want to sit and listen to the. Well, I do, but not everyone wants to sit, you know, and, and listen to the vinyl and get up and change sides and, and and listen through it. You know, we we consume everything and throw it away, and right. that's sad. Okay. Now, because there are probably several, uh, that's quite a few young producers who are getting maybe finding a couple of acts. They've got something going. If you were a young producer starting out right now, what would you do? What would be the first thing that you would do? Garth, you want to I'd start? quit. <laughs> <laughs> no, wow. No, I'm kidding. No, okay, I'm kidding, kidding. Hey. Ba basically, you guys have to really work hard. You guys have to go harder than we all did be because there's so many songs out now and so many bands and anybody you can do it. So yours has to shine above the best. And you have to live this 20, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 364 days a year. And I went to LA once on a live, and I was living with actually Bob's son. And I came home one night after six months, and he went, who are you? And I went, I'm Garth, you're made. Oh, 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 hey, hi, man. You, you know, so, so even we had to work back hard then. You guys have to work harder now. Great. Uh, so we've got three minutes, so let's go through it. Just what would you do if you were a, a, a young producer right now? I am a young producer right now. I'm 12. <laughs> oh, 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 a, a young starting out producer I'm just right joking. now. You uh, fucking son of a bitch. It's my youthful smile. Um, <laughs> what would I do? I work my ass off. I mean, I still work my ass off because I know that there's people coming up in the audience that are chasing me. So. I'm going to work hard, and I'm always going to work hard, and I'm never going to stop working hard. It's what I do. It's what I love. I love being in the studio. I love working with fellow musicians. Um, you know, that it, it's honestly a gift. It's the best thing 
that I can do. And I've never had a, a fallback plan. I think you, as young producers, don't, don't listen to your parents when they say you need something to fall back on. Because if you have a fallback plan, you're going to fall back on it. You're, yeah. not gonna, you're not going to push yourself hard enough to do it. This is all I know how to do. You know, if I stop doing this, I'll go with Joe. We'll open a bakery. We always joke <laughs> around about it. Good. I mean, that, that's it. Great, Brian. Bradley? Yeah, I agree. You've got, you just got to work hard. You've got to really want it. You've got to know the background, know music, know songs, be able to identify them. I think having a good grasp of whatever the current technology is helps. I saw a load of guys come up through just being good with Pro Tools. I, I had uh, some stuff like that, just being good with Pro Tools, put me in the room with people. Um, obviously, that's not so the case now. Lots of people can do it. But I'm sure, you know, a few years ago, if you were a whiz on Ableton, that would have got you some gigs. And they'll be the next thing and the next thing. So, you know, if you're into, if you're one of those young people and you're hip to the scene and what's going on, look at the technology, look at where the trends are going, and I think you can pick up work that way. Actually, Bob, when I met you, I think it was 1973, uh, and you were just a baby producer, and you were just a, a kid, and you have the same passion today that you had back then, which I love. So, but if you were a young producer just starting out right now, what would you do? What was the one? Okay, well, one? I, you know, this, I'm not going to repeat what you've heard here because it's all true. And um, um, what, I, what I would say is this. Uh, once you have developed the skills, once you have that passion, once you have that level of commitment, and, uh, and you could actually do something that's of value, then just get in the room. Get in the room. Either do, I mean, I thought what you did, Brad, is perfect. You, you saw somebody you really liked and said, are you looking for someone to record you? That's a great thing to do. And, and then, and worry about how to, how to do it later. Like that's, Michael Cole yesterday was great. I'm gonna offer $40 million to the Rolling Stones for 40 dates. Do you have the money? No. <laughs> I'll worry about that later, you know? Sweet. And so get in the room, I'll record you. Fantastic, when can we start? I'll call you back tomorrow. Get on the phone, I need a room, you know? And, but get in the room and get in the room to do anything. I love the idea that, that you can write with people these days, that it's acceptable now. It used to be anathema, right? You never would have let, let anyone write with you on a, on a project. So, so now you, you, know, you get in with a Justin and you say, you know, or, or, or if you are Justin, you, you say to somebody, I'd like to write with you. And you get in the room. Develop I get that a lot. I actually get, uh, people hit me on Facebook all the time. I'd like actually. to write with you. Yes. Yeah. Who has got a guitar right now? Let's go. Me and you. <laughs> there we go. All right. Warren? Yeah, I think it, it comes down to the, you know, there's the 10,000 hour rule. Mm -hmm. It takes 10,000 hours to become an expert in anything. And, uh, you know, if you don't have the passion for this job, then you're never going to put in the work. Yeah. So it comes from the passion, but that's going to get you through the amount of hours that you really need to put in. And as Bob said, when I started, I just just took every single opportunity I could to get right. in, the, in the room with somebody, no matter who they were. Sweet. Um, so, yeah. Just, Justin? Uh, I, 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 instead of echoing what everybody said, I okay. think that the, the, the number one thing that, when I look at my career, what's helped me is I've had very self-sobering conversations. If I'm not making it, why am I not making it? Because I'm not good enough. Why am I not good enough? Well, I have to be better because I have to you know, Pro Tools, I, you know, I was on it, but you know, I, what is that new technology? Because ultimately it's a very small window for success. So your success is completely hinged on how good are you and how hard are you willing to work. But, Great, <clears throat> yeah. thank you. But remember, believing makes it so, okay? Never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Don't believe what and you think. thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. <laughs>